Hello everyone, this is Lace talking about what has to be what I'm calling the day of juxtaposition. By the way, it is indeed a good day to have a good day. And it is. Here we are in California with the recall election finished and dispatched with and handily defeated. Now that it is over, um, I can not necessarily admit to happiness or a sense of relief, but we can all breathe easy with outcomes that may or may not be good. But the juxtapositions are coming from a few places. The details of the outcome of the election were clear as early as last night when it was clear that our Governor Newsom was going to win handily and prevail over the recall election. And I read and listened to quite a few news outlets talk about how this should be a galvanizing force for Newsom, that it was a strong vote of approval, um, a strong vote of confidence, and that he should now have the confidence, dare I say, the arrogance to basically in his last months as governor, he's got about a year and a half to go, to be able to just forcefully advance a position and double take the hindmost and everyone who wanted him gone can just. At the same time, at the same time, I was listening to all of this about the aftermath of the election, I was reading, um, or rather rereading, the book by Terry Real, where he talks about the winning strategies and the losing strategies. And between the juxtaposition and the synergy between the two, I could not help but think that the California recall election was one big case study in winning and losing strategies. I am rereading the book but there is a cheat sheet in the back and it talks about the winning strategies and the losing strategies. And I could not help but immerse myself in these last night. The five losing strategies, for those of you who don't know, are the losing strategies that will almost guarantee that you do not get what you want. And if you do get what you want, that you will lose the relational in the process, which is another way of saying you won't get what you want. The five losing strategies that we are to avoid in our racial justice walk and in our personal, dyadic, and small group relational positions are these. Needing to be right, controlling the, your partner, or in this case, controlling the situation, unbridled self-expression, retaliation, and withdrawal. And we saw all five of these losing strategies in sharp relief during the entire year of the recall push and then finally of this election. Needing to be right and controlling the narrative cost the state of California as much as 300 billion, million, just million. It's small potatoes, not with a B, with an M. $300 million. Now, I realize that that's a small amount for some of you. I mean, and nowadays, that's about a half a tank of gas in San Diego County. But in actuality, $300 million is a whole lot brought on by people who were unhappy about the election that happened in 2018 and wanting to redo it. And that's something that California is going to have to look at. One of the things that California tends to do when they don't like a policy or a legislation is they don't advance in a normal or a civil fashion. What they do is they try backdoor channels like recall processes. There have been numerous recall processes in the state of California. Only one was actually um, successful. That was the recall election that forced Gray Davis out of office and put Arnold Schwarzenegger in office in his place. And now this one, that was an unsuccessful effort. But regardless of the success of the effort, the amount expended is staggering. And when we look 
at that, when we look about the amount that's spent, whether in actual dollars or in metaphorical dollars, whether in terms of um, the civic square or in our personal and social lives, it makes a huge difference. At what cost do you want to see your agenda or your position advanced? Is it going to be a scorched earth policy? And even if you prevail, are you ready to deal with the ramifications of your actions? As I'm talking to you about the five losing strategies and I'm talking to you about um, the ramifications of the California election, something else needs to be thought of, and that is the six elements of an integral act. And the six elements of the integral act, the very last one, the one that I tapped on to Stephen L. Carter's five elements of an integral act are, are you ready to live with the ramifications or the consequences of your act? If you are not willing to do those things, then it probably is not an act of integrity and should probably be thought out or rethought or put aside altogether. I do not think that the people who started the recall process either had a full understanding of the cost that it would take to the citizenry of the state of California, or if they knew, they didn't care. Every single time I think of this, Every single time I think of the idea that there are people who are not vaccinated in the state of California because funds were diverted. Those funds didn't just come from thin air and no one budgets for a recall process. So it's not as though the state of California's budget had $300 million in it waiting for someone to decide, I want to try to press the reset button and subvert a democratic process, which is what a recall election is. We need to make sure that what we are doing is worth the overall cost. And so often it isn't. So often it isn't in our, in our dyadic lives, in our lives of friendships, in our lives, in our, in our racial justice lives. The needing to be right peace. Governor Newsom didn't help himself with that expensive dinner in Napa, but that expensive Napa dinner became an issue because the media helped it become an issue on the one hand. And, and that's something else to think about, too, that you had bad actors over here trying to disable or diffuse or overturn an outcome, but you also had media outlets giving them perhaps more oxygen than they deserved. And I think that when I look at, at the losing strategies in, my, in racial justice walk and in my own personal praxis, I have to think about that. How much oxygen am I giving a given issue or a given element of my walk? And that is something that people really don't want to think about. So when people talk about, in the same sense as they were talking about Hillary Clinton's emails, but the whole log of what, Repub of, of what the other party was doing over here was completely either minimized or completely ignored. That's problematic. Yes, there are people who did not like the outcome of the, of the election from a few years back and wanted to overturn it and spent most of Governor Newsom's tenure doing their best to overturn it. But I wonder how better that energy might have been spent. They used paid signature gatherers and, and whatever you think of paid signature gatherers. Um, that also meant that there was some deception going on. I remember during the petitioning, you had to have a certain number of um, signed petitions uh, in the electoral process for it to get on the ballot. I remember passing by so many of them and, and, and you, the Secretary of State writes it up. So you can't mess up too much the actual document that you may or may not sign to turn it into um, an actual ballot initiative. But the people who were selling it on at the folding card tables in front of Target or in front of Albertsons, well, they could say what they wanted to, and they did. And 
one of the losing strategies is part of unbridled self-expression. And I would add that deceptive speech is included in that, that deceptive speech. If what you are trying to do, if what you are trying to do means that you have to obfuscate or go side door or out and out deceive, then you need to think about that. And in our racial justice walk and in our personal dyadic walks, we have to think about that too. If there are things that you're nudging a little or fudging a little in your relational walk, that is worth deep interrogation. If I cannot speak clearly and plainly and call a bang a bang, is it worth saying? Is it the only way that I can have my position advanced or feel that I can be heard is through backdoor or side door messages or by pulling a bait and switch or any sort of anything that is not 100% transparent? If there is any opacity, then it needs to be rethought. The fourth losing strategy that I want to talk about here today that was shown in full display was retaliation. Retaliation is always, always going to be the death knell for dyadic and group relationships and in organizations and institutions. It is a sort of perverse justice. One of the things I talk about a lot is exactly that, offending from the, the victim position. The people who lost the gubernatorial election a few years back felt victimized. They felt that they should have gotten more than they did, that they should have won. And one way to thwart Governor Newsom, and no matter what you think of him, and like I said yesterday, he's probably not someone I'd want to have a beer with, but he is advancing policies that are on the main, decent for the marginalized people of California. And even when they're kind of makes me squint a little, makes my molars itch a little, it's better than anybody else on the ballot. And no matter what I think of Governor Newsom, I'm glad he won the recall. But when you're looking at that, Terry Rill talks about the three things, the, the offending from the victim position, the perverse communication. I want you to feel as badly as I feel. And I want you to think about that in terms of electoral politics and in terms of policy setting, both on a legislative and on a corporate level. If the whole idea of a policy is to make someone feel terrible, is to make someone hurt, is to harm them, that's retaliation. Whether for actual or perceived slight, it doesn't matter. One of the non-negotiables, non-negotiables of full respect living is that we do not offend from the victim position, that we do not go tit for tat, and that we do not forget proportionality even when consequences are warranted. They are never to be worse than the harm endured. Let me say that again. And that's something that needs to be remembered both in an electoral process, in grassroots organizing, in racial justice and other kinds of social justice work, and in our dyadic and group relationships. Is it proportional? And are you taking undue pleasure from the act. That's a big one. That's a huge one. Are you shouting with glee? Are you rubbing your hands like a cartoon villain at the idea of someone being harmed, of someone getting theirs? You can use any language you like. But if there's any element of that, then that also needs to be rethought and perhaps set aside. Passive aggressiveness is also a big part of it. People used a lot of reasons for wanting to recall Governor Newsom, and Governor Newsom didn't help himself with that damn dinner. But a lot of the reasons were disingenuous. We want liberty. Liberty to what? And, and in the last year and a half of COVID, we want liberty not to wear masks. We want liberty not to 
have to abide by CDC regulations. Here's the thing. Whenever people talk about freedom from having to do something or freedom to do something, that tends to end when it harms another person. And as we have seen, when it comes to COVID, the people that have been hurt first and worst have been marginalized people. And the same people who have not wanted to vaccinate or to wear a mask or both are the first ones who are demanding the absolute best care with the absolute highest priority when they or their loved ones get sick. And in the terms of the passive aggressiveness here, basically saying, I want the freedom to make what may be a funky decision, but I also want freedom from the ramifications and the consequences of my actions. We can see this in the COVID response, but we can see it in other things too, such as some tax policies that Governor Newsom was championing, some of the other policies that long range would have good effects of the people of California as a whole, as and particularly marginalized people in this state. And the fact that people had a problem with that enough to spend $300 million for that is something worth talking about and, and, and bringing it back home to the issue of race. What are you willing to spend 300 million actual or metaphorical dollars on in order to advance a funky position of your own? One of the things that Terry Real does, because we adapt Terry Real's methods um, for our purposes here in terms of, of, of dyadic relational walking and also in terms of groups and racial justice. One of the things that he asks when he's talking to couples is, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? And um, sometimes that, that's the binary. And when we're talking about racial justice, when we're talking about living out ethos and praxis, a lot of times another thing that Terry deals with is the idea of individuality. I am the exception to the rules. Everybody wants to be the exception. Everybody. I love being the exception. I love being the only person who knows about this particular lipstick. I like to tell myself that I'm the only one that knows about it, but apparently they made about a million of them. Shh. I'm not as individual as I think. I'm not as unique as I think. And therefore, I probably don't deserve the carve outs and the exceptions and the accommodations that I think I do. And my not getting the accommodations that I feel that I am due does not constitute harm. In the same way that my wearing a mask, even though I'm double vaccinated, does not constitute harm when I walk into the coffee shop on University Avenue. I'm keeping the cashier safe. I'm keeping my fellow coffee goers, coffee house goers, coffee drinkers, the people who are in there drinking coffee with me. <laughs> I'm keeping them safe too. Yay! It doesn't harm me to wear a piece of fabric, except of course for my lipstick game. But I'm willing to sacrifice that. It is the same thing when we talk about our racial justice or our social justice walks. What are you willing to sacrifice and is it as big a deal as you think it is? Those are the two questions that I ask myself all the time. What am I being asked to give up or set aside either temporarily or permanently towards the goal that I say that I want and being the woman that I say I want to be? Because sometimes you can't have it both ways. And I am not going to punish anyone because of my frustration or my activation or my trigger response. Leads us to the fifth losing strategy, withdrawal. And this is a cautionary tale for both sides, for both sides of the recall election equation and for both sides of our racial justice walk, both for people who may be on the wrong side of the issue or the wrong side of history and people who may be on the right side of the, of, of the issue and of history. And it's this, withdrawal can come from two things. One, you feel that you lost, you wave your white flag and then you slink off into the night. 
You can do that in a number of ways, passive aggressively. You can do that in a, well, I didn't want it anyway. And then they go off and they're either nursing their wounds or they're planning their next attack, which is sometimes what you see in withdrawals. And it makes me wonder what's going to happen in the next year or two when the same people who funded the recall election, well, what else are they going to do? What else, what, what other plans do they have up their sleeve to sabotage not just a governor, but an entire state, an entire assembly, an entire state senate, and also stymieing regional and local boards? Nefarious actions, and particularly for the purposes of lace on race, as we have seen since February, one nefarious act can have thundering repercussions. The ripples in the water spread far and wide, and they are more durable than you think. It can come from one of two places, resignation or retaliation. Or one more, because we're going to eventually talk about the winning side. Withdrawal can come from Winning can come from prevailing because now you can be very top down, right? Well, I won. There's nothing that you have to say to me. These people have absolutely nothing that we as the state of California or as Governor Newsom would say that we have to consider. We don't have to think about their perspective at all. And while it is easy to do that when people make funky moves for funky motives, it is worth our effort to unpack what they were asking. Governor Newsom won handily, but there was, if you, if you look deep into the demographics, and we're going to see that as it goes on, because, you know, the day after the demographics are quick and dirty, but you're going to be able to see this. He did get some erosion in his democratic base. He got some erosion with working class people, and it could be because the, the message from the opposition was was relentless, and there were some media outlets that, 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 put, that forwarded that position. But some of it also could be, what are the real fears? And going back to the vaccination issue, going back to the masking issue, there are cohorts of people that are doing neither of those things. And what they wind up getting from the rest of us is contempt, another losing strategy, right? How do we win gracefully is as important, as important as how we lose gracefully. That's a big deal to remember. Governor Newsom, like I said earlier, has now been given the full imprimatur. He can, he can do whatever he wants. He's got full reign, carte blanche. And I would suggest to Governor Newsom that he doesn't take that. That actually he enters these next days, weeks, months with a sense of humility. There were after all, regardless of how they were manipulated, and they were, there was a large tranche of the voting electorate that was mad enough at him to sign those petitions that got the recall on the ballot in the first place. And while he won handily, he didn't win everybody. There are some people who are not pleased, and we can dismiss them and minimize their concerns and just say that they're butthurt. But they'll be back in the next midterm election come 2022, and they'll be back in the next election in 2024. We need to really look. We need to be careful not to pander, just as for a long time, every single time um, a given party won, the media would go and say, let's look at these tranches of people and see what they want, because they're the most important people. They are an important population, but they are not the only population and not even the most important, but that doesn't mean that their concerns should not be listened to. I think one of the great ironies when it comes to progressive um, politics, anything to the left of, 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 of traditional Republicanism, is that there are significant slices of the population who do not believe that the people whose platforms are for them, 
that will benefit them are actually for them. And they consistently vote against their own interests. And there was a there was a minority opinion, yes, but a significant minority opinion in the state of California who voted against their own interests when they voted for the recall. They are not to be just poo-pooed and set aside and looked at with side eye and contempt. They are to be considered. When we look at these exit polls, some of the things that we're going to see is that people did not feel listened to by Newsom. They didn't feel listened to by Newsom's party. That's something to look at. And especially when we're looking at it through the lens and the angle of race, we have to be able to understand people who are not fully with us yet. We need to be able to stay in the car with them when it comes to legislation and other kinds of policy, both grassroots and electoral, in our offline lives, such as our work lives, our church lives, our family lives. And we need to look at it when we are doing intentional social justice and racial justice work. We cannot write off a new population and contempt is a way of writing them off. I refuse to do that. The, four, the five losing strategies, when I'm looking at this election and when I'm looking at the work that I'm doing for us here at Lace on Race um, is so important. In the next video, we're gonna talk about the five winning strategies and how they can play out in the public square in grassroots or electoral politics, as well as with our work here at Lace on Race and in our platonic and romantic even, but our dyadic relationships and our relationships in, in small groups. It's going to be a great segue into talking about the winning strategies and how they have application and relevance in every single part of our lives, from the public square to our kitchen table. Stay tuned. In case you liked this, let me tell you, like it, share it, feel free. I'm having a really good wig day, so share far and wide. We are on Twitter. We are on Facebook. We are on YouTube. There's another one that we're on that I'm forgetting the name of, but my staff knows we're on all those platforms. Check us out on our Facebook page, um, facebook.com slash Lace on Race. Check out the new refurbished website. Our formal space is laceonrace.com, but It'll also show you how to enter what we call the cafe, and that's where the work is done. If you want to message me, you can message me below in the comment section, or you can send me a private message either on the website or on the Facebook page, and I am here for it. Lace on the Race is very carefully nonpartisan when I'm in the capacity as I am right now as the executive director of the Lace on Race Center for Racial Equity. I do not take partisan positions. I can speak about the race and about politics, and I do. I can speak to generalized principles, and I do. So if you like more of this, like, subscribe, follow, depending on what platform you are, hook up with me in a message. I'll walk you through everything you need to know. It only gets better from here. And the race is only the race the, the election is only going to get more intense as we move into the midterms in 2022, having losing and winning strategies under our belt so we know what to do and what not to do, how to be, so that we can advance the position and the mission statement and the North Star of Lace on Race, lessening and mitigating the harm endured by black and brown people, perpetuated by white people and white supremacy. All of these things are so important and we do it all right here. Thanks so much for listening. Can't wait to talk to you all more again. Bye.